Hello, Dr. Kelly here, and I'll be walking you through a hand-calculated single-sample t-test for a one-tail uh, hypothesis test. Let's say I have a student who I recommend to make use of tutoring. And the student says, oh, I don't want to go to tutoring. The people who go to tutoring, they're, they're not very capable. They don't do very well in school, and, and I don't want to hang out with them. Just think about that student's null hypothesis about people who get tutoring. That view that people who get tutoring are either like everybody else or or even not as, as capable as everybody else. All right, so I present to a student an alternative view, something that I'm going to have to convince a student about. This alternative uh, hypothesis uh, is that the people who uh, receive tutoring, that their GPA is greater than that of the college GPA. Because you see, I'm actually going to tell a student that the people who go to tutoring are the motivated students, and these are students who will do well. And that many people who go to tutoring might be doing well on a lot of topics, but maybe there's one they don't do so good at, and so they get the tutoring so that they're going to do well. This is the alternative hypothesis. Why? Because I'm the one who has to convince the student of a different view. And this is a null hypothesis, that people getting the tutoring are less than or the same in terms of GPA to the general college, and that's the view that the student holds. So because we're looking for a change of view, that people getting tutoring have a higher GPA, that's our alternative or our research hypothesis. So let's explore this. The first thing that student and I have to figure out is, what's the general GPA of students at the college? And let's say that we find out that it's 2.5. Next, we go ahead and we randomly sample people who are receiving tutoring and uh, calculate their average GPA. My claim is that this sample is coming from the population where those people receiving tutoring have higher GPAs. The null hypothesis is that, no, the sample is just from the general college population, and they're just like the general population, or, or maybe they're worse off in terms of GPA. So let's say that the GPA for our sample is 2.75, that the estimated standard deviation based upon the sample is 0.5, and that the sample consisted of 31 students. So I shared a student, hey, you convinced? General population is 2.5, sample mean was 2.75. And let's say so I'm talking to you says, well, yeah, but you could still just by chance get that 2.75. I'm not so sure I'm convinced. You know, with hypothesis testing, the way that it works is you have a, a null hypothesis. You go out and you collect data, and you want to say, this data that I collected, it doesn't fit with the null hypothesis. The probability of me getting this data, if you believe in the null hypothesis, is really small. So small that it, it's, it's not reasonable to still hold on to that null hypothesis. So we got to frame this in a way so we can see just how unusual is this 2.75. If the null hypothesis is true, could it easily have happened? Or is it so unlikely to happen that it's no longer really tenable to keep holding on to that null hypothesis? To figure out how unusual a sample mean of 2.75 is, we need that context of a distribution of sample means. This distribution of sample means says, what would we expect if the null hypothesis is true? Well, if the null hypothesis is true, and we randomly sample uh, from it, we would expect the sample mean to be pretty close to 2.5. But how much variability should there be? Well, that would uh, depend upon the standard error of the mean. Our estimated standard error of the mean is approximately equal to a standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Our estimated standard deviation was uh, 0.5. Our sample size was 31. So 0.5 divided by a square root of 31, that's equal to 0.5 divided by 5.57, which is equal to, if we round to the hundredth place, 0 0.09. That standard error tells us how far away is the sample mean from the population mean. Uh, again, standard error is 0 0.09, so one standard error would be uh, 2.59, two standard errors away would be 2.68, three standard errors would be 2.77 above the mean. And our sample mean is 1, 2, 
and almost three standard errors above the population mean. That seems to tell me that that sample mean is pretty unusual. Uh, didn't just happen due to chance. So just looking at this, we get a sense that our, our sample mean, if we're going to believe the null hypothesis, our sample mean is is really, really unusual. So unusual that it would make sense to reject the null hypothesis. At least that's a claim. But but let's actually go through the, the mathematical steps, if you will, uh, which is going to involve uh, looking at the t-table. OK, let's just pause for one moment and consider the different types of t-tests that we can do. So one possible t-test that we can do is where we do a, a one-tail t-test and we're making uh, the argument that the sample mean should be above the population mean. And that's the case in this scenario. The student thinks that uh, the people receiving tutoring, their GPA is like everyone else or, or perhaps even over here and I am trying to convince them that no the people receiving tutoring uh, their GPA is actually much higher right so the burden and proof is on me to make that claim so we're doing a, a one tail t test and I gotta show that that sample mean is above the population mean on the other hand if if I had been trying to convince the student the opposite. If I was trying to convince a student that people receiving tutoring had much lower GPAs, then again it would be a one-tail uh, t-test, but um, all of our, our alpha would be on the left-hand side. And so we'd need a really low uh, sample mean in order to reject an hypothesis. Uh, another alternative would be a, a two-tail t-test. And that would be if I was simply trying to convince the student that people who receive tutoring are different than everyone else in terms of their GPA. Either uh, as a group their GPA is much higher than the population or that their GPA as a group is much lower. Now at this point you're familiar with alpha, that 0.05. So alpha says if the null hypothesis is true, what proportion of time am I willing to mistakenly reject the null hypothesis? So for this one tail t-test, the alpha is on the right hand side. So the student and I going into this, we know that the student might be right, but just due to sampling error, um, we might end up rejecting that null hypothesis 0.05 of the time. So this isn't perfect. I'm not going to be able to prove in terms of a logical proof that people receiving tutoring uh, have higher GPAs on average than everyone else. Because there's always this alpha 0.05 that maybe the sample working with wasn't representative. If we had been doing a um, two-tail hypothesis, then that 0.05 would be divided in half with 0.025 uh, below and 0.025 above. But again, this is a, a one-tail t-test. I'm looking to convince the student that the people receiving tutoring their GPA is higher. All of our alpha of uh, 0.05 is here in the right-hand tail. OK, so let's look at the t-table. Lots of different ways uh, to create a, a t-table. So they're all going to look a little bit different. But here are some key concepts. You typically have degrees of freedom uh, that you're going to need to use the t-table. And you're going to need to know whether you're doing a one-tail or two-tail test and what your alpha level is. We're working with an alpha of 0.05 because that's the industry standard, if you will. We're doing a one-tail test, but we do need to know our degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is equal to your sample size minus one when doing a uh, t-test, a uh, single sample t-test. So our sample size is 31. 31 minus one gets us 30. That's our degrees of freedom. So in order to use this uh, t-table, we're going to look up 30 degrees of freedom. That's our row that we care about. And in terms of the column, we're using this left column, one tail t-test alpha 0.05. So the row of 30 degrees of freedom, the column of alpha 0.05 for a single sample t-test, and that t-critical is 1.697. So for this uh, one-tail t-test, uh, our t-critical, 1.697. If that sample mean is 1.697 or more standard errors above the uh, population mean, we will reject the null hypothesis. I don't know. Look at this picture. What do you think? Do you think it's more than 1.697 standard errors above uh, the population mean? 
Yes, that sample mean is more than 1.697 standard errors above the uh, population mean. Since the sample mean falls in the shaded reject zone, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, but let's find out exactly how many standard errors that sample mean is above the, the population mean. And to do that, we use our uh, t-test formula. Here's our t-test formula. The t-test is equal to the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the estimated standard error, which in this case is equal to 2.75 minus 2.5, that is our sample mean minus the population mean, divided by 0 0.09, that's our estimated standard error. That's equal to 0.25 divided by 0 0.09. And that comes out to be uh, 2.78. So what this hand-calculated t-test value is telling us is that our sample mean is 1, 2.78, or 2.78 total, standard errors above the mean. And since that's beyond the t-critical of 1.697, it's in the shaded reject zone, we will be rejecting uh, the null hypothesis right here. So after the student and I have had this conversation, we've found out what the population mean is, we went out and we got a, a sample mean, figured out the, uh, the sample mean, the, the estimated uh, standard uh, deviation. Uh, we went through and uh, figured out what the t-critical was. We then uh, hand calculated the t-test uh, value. We saw that was in the uh, shaded reject zone. The student and I come to an understanding that, yeah, we should go ahead and we should reject the null hypothesis, and that there's evidence supporting uh, the research hypothesis. Have I proved to the student that people getting tutoring are uh, getting consistently higher GPAs than those who are not? I haven't proved it in terms of a logical sense, because remember there's that alpha of 0.05. This could have just been a result of a, a non-representative sample, and, and the student and I both knew that going in when we selected an alpha of 0.05. But let's just say that we found good, strong evidence supporting that. And so being reasonable people, we'll uh, go ahead and we'll reject the null and say that the research hypothesis was supported. And then we'll continue to keep our eyes open for further evidence in either direction. All right, take care.